Hi, my name is Michael Mosley, and I'm a missionary affiliate with New International. I love the theme of our organization, which says we proclaim Christ and make disciples globally. I'm also the executive director for Catalyst for Africa. We began that ministry in 2013, and we have four phrases that we live by. The first and most important is, together we're changing the world in Jesus' name, one relationship at a time. The second phrase we live by is linking hearts, changing lives. We use an Adinkra symbol from the Ghanaian culture, which basically says akoma in Twaso, which means linked hearts. Thirdly, we love to say we wanna go small and go deep because we believe in creating small training development we can interact with each other and to grow together. And that has been so effective and so important, not only for our African leaders, but for everyone who's participating in it. And it creates a model that helps to transform the way people grow together, challenge each other. And the last phrase that we love to live by is an African proverb that says, if you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together. Those are the phrases that we live by. And as we have seen over the past nine years, God has truly used these to help transform communities in 16 different countries throughout Africa. We love what we do at Catalyst for Africa, and we would love for you to partner with us as we say together, we're changing the world in Jesus' name, one relationship at a time. Good morning, church. I greet you in the name of Jesus. So glad to be with you all this morning. And uh, as I was talking to Pastor Arlene this morning and I was watching people come in, the Lord was saying to me, this is the kingdom of God. And uh, so I want you to turn to your neighbor and say to them, you look like the kingdom of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Isn't heaven going to be wonderful? <laughs> well, um, I'm so grateful to God to be with you all this morning. I love your pastor. I love the church. I love your staff. I even love Chris. <laughs> um, so I guess the first thing we need to ask is, how many Philadelphia Eagle fans do we have in the house? Wow. Wow. All right, how many Chief fans do we have in the house? And, and how many of you really don't care? <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. My wife and I are having a Super Bowl party of two tonight, and we don't care who wins. I do want to introduce to you my beloved. This is my wife, Pam. If you could stand up and let everybody see how beautiful you are. Come on, see you. We've been married a year and a half, and it's been the best year and a half of my life. Amen? So we thank God. So this is Missions Week, and I know that, that God has been moving on your hearts, and all of you are called to Africa, right? How many of you all are ready to go to Africa? <laughs> well, it's, amen. It's an interesting thing because, you know, God loves each one of us, and he I believe he puts a calling on each one of us, that each one of you has a calling to do ministry. Maybe you don't believe that right now, but my prayer for you when we leave this place is that God will put a passion in your heart to do ministry. Because men and women, there are lost people outside the walls of this church who need you, not me or Pastor Arlene or Pastor Kip or Pastor Chris. They need you to be that voice of healing and reconciliation. Amen? So as, as you saw in that video, I, I've been doing Catalyst for Africa ministry for the past, really we're celebrating 10 years in April, but I love that phrase that says, together we're changing the world in Jesus' name, one relationship at a time. Would you just say that with me right now? Together we're changing the world in Jesus' name, one relationship at a time. Amen? So I want to share with you a story. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. It comes from John chapter 21. 
And it's a story of relationship reconciled. It's a story of Jesus meeting one of his disciples and reconciling him unto himself. And I believe it's a word picture for us. So if you would, bow your heads and close your eyes and pray with me now as we begin to look at God's word. Father, thank you for every man and woman in this room and for those listening online. I pray that by the power of your spirit, that you would speak to us by the power of your word. God, your word tells us that your word is sharper than any two-edged sword dividing us under to the joints and marrow, to the very discerning of our thoughts. And we ask, God, that your word would penetrate even to the discerning of our thoughts, that you would transform us from the inside out. And we trust you now in Jesus' name. Amen. So hear the word of God, John 21. Afterward... Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. And he said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, John's writing this book, he's talking about himself, said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off. He jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat, dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. So this story, it's an interesting story. I'm sure many of you have heard that story before. But to me, it's a compelling image of why Jesus came on this earth. Think about it for a minute. Jesus came to Peter very similarly to this the very first time he met him. Do you remember that? And, And Peter was fishing, and he hadn't caught anything, and he said, throw your net on the one side, and he did, and they caught so many fish, the nets began to break, and they brought them all in shore. And Jesus said to him, Peter, from now on, you'll be fishers of men. And he said to him, follow me. Peter dropped his nets. James and John dropped their nets, and they began to follow Jesus for three years 
following his ministry, learning from him, sitting at his feet, eating at the table together with him, seeing Jesus do miracle after miracle after miracle. He raised the dead. He cast out demons. He healed the sick. He did all the, he loved women. And, and he showed this culture what it was like to be God incarnate, God with flesh on him. And I love this story because Peter was the one when Jesus said, who do people say that I am? Peter said, you're the Messiah. You're the, you're the one who's come to set us free. And Jesus said, upon your shoulders, I'm going to build my church. On Peter's shoulders, he said, I'm going to build my church. Can you imagine if Jesus said to you this morning, upon your shoulders, I'm going to build my church? How would you feel this morning? <laughs> like, bring it. No, God, I'm not worthy. I'm not ready. But Jesus said to Peter, upon you, I'm going to build my church. And so for three years, they learned, they loved, they, they, they challenged, they made mistakes, they did all these things, and then Jesus was crucified. And you know the story that the night before he was crucified, Peter was the only disciple that hung around. But even in his hanging around, he denied Jesus what? Three times. And it happened to be little servant girls that were coming up to him, aren't you from Galilee? Aren't you one of his disciples? No, I'm not. And he denied Jesus. And then Jesus, the next morning, was beaten, flogged, crucified, dead, put in the grave, and then he rose again. And he met with the disciples many different times when he came, when he rose again. And this is the last story we have. Isn't it interesting? Don't you think for a minute, what was going on in Peter's mind that he decided to go back home and to go fishing again. Don't you think it odd? Jesus said to Peter, from now on, you'll be fishers of men. And yet, Peter decides to go back home and take disciples who didn't even know how to fish and said, hey, let's go fishing. What do you think was going on inside of Peter in that moment? Men and women, I believe Peter was in a place of shame, he was in a place of condemnation. He was in a place of worthlessness. And he was looking at himself and he said, you know what? I'm just going to go back to my old way of living. I wonder this morning if some of us may feel like Peter. Maybe you made a decision to follow Jesus when you were young. And then you've fallen away. And you've turned your back. Or you're, you're, you're stuck in a place where you feel like all I have is shame and guilt and condemnation and unworthiness. I want you to know Jesus is showing up today. And he's coming to give you life. Because Peter, I think, had he caught fish that night with all of his disciples, I think he would have kept being a fisherman. I think he would have forgotten about Jesus, honestly. I think he would have lived in his guilt and his shame and his condemnation. And he said, you know what? This is my lot. I'm a fisherman. That's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. But you know what? Peter went out with his disciples. They were out in the boat. And I love that Jesus just showed up. Isn't it amazing that Jesus just happened to show up on the shore where they had gone fishing. And I love this story because Peter's, Peter's out in the boat with all the disciples. Jesus shows up. He's got a fire. He's grilling some fish, and he's got some bread, and he hollers out to them, Hey, did you catch anything? As if he didn't know. <laughs> and they're like, No, we caught nothing. And then he says, Throw your net on the right-hand side of the boat. And they did, and they caught 153 large fish. Now, I know some of you have been educated in seminary and you've studied the Bible. So I want to ask you a question. Why were there 153 fish? Anybody know? Anybody? No? Well, I'll just tell you. 
I don't know either. <laughs> All I know is that they counted the fish and that there were 153 of them. And I love that Jesus said to them, bring some fish, and he had breakfast with them. The thing I love about Jesus is that he wasn't known as like a great orator. He wasn't a great preacher. He was a person that just wanted to get down and sit with you and have a meal with you. That's the kingdom of God, men and women. That's why I do what I do with my African leaders all over Africa. I've been in 21 different African countries. And every time I go and I do our leadership training and we have a small group of men and women that gather around the table and we spend more time saying, tell me your story. Tell me where you've come from. Tell me how Jesus came into your life. Tell me what God's calling you to do. And as we spend time around that table, and we do that for three or four days, by the end of our conference, my African brothers and sisters say to me, this has changed my life forever. Because they use what we did over a three-day period, and they go back into their own village, into their own place of ministry, and they build relationships one relationship at a time. So Jesus has come, he's built the fire, he's cooked the fish, and he's had this amazing meal with these disciples. And they know it's the Lord. But here's the kicker, men and women. After the meal, Jesus says to Peter, can you just step aside over here? And so Peter is away with Jesus away from the other disciples and he says to him Simon son of John do you love me more than these and I don't know what the these is maybe the these is the fish maybe the these is the disciples maybe the these is his home village his hometown his identity where he's come from but he said to, to, to Peter Simon son of John do you love me more than these and to Peter He's known as being impetuous. And he's like, oh, yes, Lord, you, you know that I love you. And he says, feed my lambs. And, and it's very intentional. Feed my lambs. What's a lamb compared to a sheep? A baby. That, that Jesus told Peter, look after the little children first, I believe. Go after the children. And then he says to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Oh, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And then Jesus looks at him a third time. And he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he says in the word that it hurt Peter. And I can imagine Peter breaking down in that moment, falling on his knees at Jesus' feet, and feeling all the shame and all the guilt and all the unworthiness and the betrayal, everything that he was feeling because Jesus was pushing into his pain. Men and women, I want you to know Jesus wants to push into your pain, not to condemn you, not to wound you, not to hurt you, but to redeem you. Amen? And so in the midst of that, as Peter, I believe, is on his knees, and I believe he's weeping, Jesus says to Peter, when you were young, you dressed and did as you want, but when you grow old, other people are going to dress you and extend your arms where you don't want them to be extended, meaning he was going to be crucified too. And the last thing that Jesus said to Peter was one of the first things that he said to Peter, follow me. Men and women, we're in this church this morning because Jesus showed up at the lakeside and he redeemed Peter. Amen? And in that moment, in that koine moment, when Jesus was one-on-one -on -one with Peter, he redeemed Peter. He forgave Peter. He established Peter, and he said, it's upon your shoulders I'm going to build my church. And after that, Peter was the one who went and preached the gospel, and thousands upon thousands came to Christ. You know, Jesus didn't lead that many people unto himself. You know that. He wasn't a great evangelist, but Peter was. And you know why he was? Because he showed up 
at the lakeside and he redeemed him in his brokenness. Now, men and women, Jesus wants to do the same with you. He wants to redeem your hurt. He wants to redeem your shame and your guilt. And not only that, he wants you to go outside these walls and he wants you to find broken, hurting, wounded people and just say to them, do you love Jesus? And just listen to what they say. Do you love Jesus? Oh, yeah, I love Jesus. Yeah, but have you been forgiven? I, I can't be forgiven. You don't know what I've done. Jesus redeems us from all of it, men and women. This is the missionary message, that we would just show up on the lakeside and cook a hot dog next, next Saturday. You know what I'm talking about? You know, I can do some New Yorker. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, extend that hot dog in the name of Jesus and say, it's for this time that I come as a, as a voice of reconciliation, a voice of healing, a voice of salvation. And that most people aren't going to listen to somebody looking like me. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, I got a tat, but, you know, some of you, y'all are, y'all are like covered. People see me and they're like, yeah, that's a little white pasty boy. I'm not going to listen to him. But God's going God's to bring people across your path that only you can reach. Hallelujah. <laughs> Men and women. We need to change the world in Jesus' name, one relationship at a time, one hot dog at a time. I don't know where you are this morning. Maybe you feel like Peter. Maybe you've run away. Maybe you're hurt. Maybe you've got guilt and shame and unforgiveness and whatever it is. I come today to beg you, to plead with you, to say, do you love him? Do you love Jesus? Because he loves you. He loves you. He loves you so much, you've heard it, that he gave his life that you might find salvation in him. I don't know where you are this morning, but Jesus wants to give you life. But he wants to give you more than that. He wants to give you the gift that you would be a life giver to those outside these walls. Amen? Would you pray with me now? God in heaven, we bless you and we thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness. And Jesus, we thank you for showing up on the lakeside and pulling Peter aside and redeeming his guilt and shame and unworthiness in a moment. And you changed the world through that guy. And God, I believe this morning you want to do the same in this room. And if there's anyone who's feeling shame and guilt and unworthiness. Father, I pray they would just lay it at your feet. They would cry out and say, Jesus, I do love you. I do want to follow you. And that, Lord, you would use them to reach people in this community and around the world with the good news that you alone are our salvation. And so, Father, I pray by your Spirit, redeem those that are hurting this morning and allow us to be the voice of healing, salvation, reconciliation, that we can change the world, Jesus, one relationship, a, re, one relationship at a time, through you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Let's all thank Michael. <laughs> Michael, where are you going? I was going to hug you. The hug is worth it. The hug is totally worth it. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, yeah, the band. We're finding the band. Where's the band? They're going to come back. Um, gosh, there was so much there. I can't, even, um, I, can't, I can't even tell you all the things that are going on in my spirit right now as I was just listening uh, to Michael's message uh, because... He, um, he may be a pasty uh, white guy, but 
I'm an old pasty white woman, okay? But let me tell you, there was, there was a time that I was a thug, right? Because I tell you all that I'm in recovery from drugs and alcohol all the time. I came into the to recovery when I was 27 years old. And before that, I mean, I pretty much thought everything was over for me. Um, I thought, you know, I'd broken all the commandments. And don't ask me how. And, you know, pretty much it was, it was over. And when I came into the program of recovery, I thought, well, okay, I'll, I'll manage to limp along till the end now maybe. But, you know, certainly God isn't going to have anything to do with me. And until he gave me um, a message um, that was exactly the message that uh, Michael just preached about right now, the three words, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. I said, I can't feed those sheep. I'm like, I got, I got a sheet, but I ain't got no sheep, right? I mean, look at, take a look at all the reasons why I can't do the thing that you're asking me to do for you. Take a look. I mean, God, here, it's all written down. There's all the reasons why I can't go out and do anything for you. And he kept saying, feed my sheep because, um, you know, I've learned over the years, and I hope that um, God is speaking to you today, his great love and redemption in your life, his great mercy and forgiveness uh, for whatever is keeping you stuck today. I hope you hear that, accept that, uh, because God has amazing plans for you um, in his kingdom, um, something that will fulfill you and be beyond your wildest dreams, as we say, uh, in recovery. And so I want to thank you again, Michael, and, I, and we're going to want to let Michael's message just uh, settle deep into our bones for a second. Don't, don't run away deep into our souls. Let's just pause and let it resonate for a second. That love of God for you, that sacrifice of God through Jesus for you, that redemption of whatever that thing is that's keeping you stuck for you. And then the joy of knowing that you can side by side with Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit go and make hot dogs and spread the good news of Jesus' love. Allow that to settle and resonate. And that's why we want to have an opportunity to give here at the end of our service rather than in the middle like we usually do. Because giving is one way that you can be involved in the mission of Jesus right now and right here. There are four ways to give here at Grace Church. Um, the ways are on the screen. We also have these little boxes on the walls by um, all of the doors. Um, sometimes we like to say put a buck in the box or some bucks in the box. Um, some cash in the cans, whatever. But there's ways for you to give um, so that um, others can live. Um, in addition, you were all handed when you came in uh, a card with a promise for missions giving above and beyond your regular giving. And this is an amount, here, listen up, this is an amount that you trust God will provide to you so that you can give back to missions throughout the year. This is a trusting God thing. Pray, hear God tell you the amount, then trust God will provide that amount. And when he does, give it. It's as easy as that. Because God is faithful. God is faithful. You know, there's no place for your name on this card, on this mission giving card. It's between God and you. But hand in the card so that we can let our mission partners know what God is telling you. That's the only reason we ask you to turn in the card. So they're in this last, last song. It's called The Blessing because God wants to bless you. He wants to keep you. He's making his face to shine upon you. He wants to be gracious unto you. He's lifting up his face on you to give you peace and a purpose and a plan. So during this last song, please get up and give. Uh, put your cards in with your regular uh, giving into the cans or um, in the basket in the center, um, if you would. So let's stand to pray.
God, we thank you for your love and your grace. It's beyond what we can comprehend. But then again, you say that in your word. You say, you know, may you know the love of God, though it's too great for us to actually understand. But we thank you for it. And we pray for your financial provision so that we can give so that others can live. Bless this. Bless us. Bless our partners. Bless those that will be blessed. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.